Uh, hi, I'm Leo. I'm the co-founder of Startup and Angel. I'm very, very happy to uh, welcome you all to uh, the first day of our uh, FinTech event series. Um, so today uh, we've uh, prepared uh, an event to uh, give you hopefully uh, the knowledge, the connection and the technology partner to fuel your growth. Um, very, very excited and thankful to my team for uh, preparing this event and all our partners uh, you'll be meeting today. Um, you know, feel free. Uh, this is a you know very interactive event. Uh, you know, you will have the chance uh, during the breakout room in the last 20 minutes of the event to tell us uh, who you are, what you're working on. Uh, but please feel free to uh, use the the chat functionality as well to. Uh, introduce yourself uh, and tell us where you are logging in uh, today. So now hopefully we all ready to go, welcome. Uh, so in terms of uh, agenda today, we'll kick off with uh, a panel discussion uh, on FinTech funding and industry trends worldwide. Uh, we've got a great panel moderated by Brendan uh, based in Melbourne um, director at Fund Squire. Uh, we also have um, Betsy uh, stepping in for Fupay, uh, one of the most promising Australian fintech. Michaela, uh, VP at Wallpay, uh, based out of London, checking in early with us. Uh, Mike Dovey, uh, GP at AAG Firemark Ventures, as well as Stuart uh, from Salesforce, their fintech guru. Um, so a few words about us, Startup and Angel, basically uh, we started the journey just over five years ago with my co-founder Axel. Uh, we've now organized you know, hundreds of events uh, like this one, most of which are, have still been done in the, in the real world. Uh, we had the, the real chance to travel 15 countries uh, you know, in Southeast Asia, Africa, um, and uh, today uh, I'm checking from uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, we launched last year um, a, an online community where you're all welcome to, uh, to join, um, you know, to pretty much meet other founders, investors, uh, share your wins, uh, as well as access uh, knowledge, uh, special deals from our technology partners. Um, the community is really fast growing, uh, very active. Uh, we've got events like this one, but also uh, four nightly catch ups, uh, you know, or just over virtual coffee. Um, so, you know, feel free to, uh, to join. Uh, you know, a few words about uh, our company powering startup and angels, Australians, uh, you know, founded uh, 11 years ago now out of Sydney with the vision to basically create value through uh, meaningful connections. Uh, we help a number of international scale-ups uh, come uh, you know, to Asia Pacific from Europe, from US, uh, and you know, offer them uh, a number of market entry solutions. Uh, with Australian talent, we help you find the right talents for your, for your business in Australia. Uh, and then you know, through various network and activities, we try and aim hard to make the world a better place. Uh, and this year we're launching um, Australian's Ventures, uh, focusing on HR tech business in Australia. Uh, so basically, uh, a big, big thanks to all our partners uh, who uh, support us, uh, have been supporting us for you know, a few years now. Uh, I won't name them all, but I'll start uh, a big thanks to uh, OVH Cloud, um, our Platinum's partner, as well as, uh, you know, in particular, partners who have been instrumental uh, helping us uh, power this fintech event series, Fund Square, uh, Salesforce App Exchange, um, Advisor, uh, RBA Zero, and WorldPay. Uh, joining us today, a big thanks to all our community partners, so especially fintech Australia. Uh, so now uh, I'll. Uh, Hand over to uh, Brendan, uh, moderating the panel. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for all your help and energy, Brendan. And uh, the floor is all yours. Enjoy. Thanks, Leo. <clears throat> you must be a busy boy with all those businesses going on. Wow, impressive. All right, uh, I had no idea there were so many. Uh, so, 
Yeah, thank you very much for organizing today. Um, I've been in fintech for about five years now. Um, it's a big passion area of mine. Uh, so yeah, I, I really appreciate that, uh, that the Startup and Angels and Austral Alliance team have, uh, have put together a three-day series, uh, made it a really nice, friendly time so we can get as many people from across the world involved. Um, so what I guess we would kind of, uh, Startup and Angels, predominantly focuses in Australia. Uh, so that's probably gonna be the, where the majority of people are from today. Uh, but we're definitely choosing this time zone specifically or this time of day to, to allow other time zones to be involved. So across, across Asia should be a nice growing area for us to focus on and, uh, and also Europe will be uh, coming online as well. So yeah, really, um, really excited to, to talk to this panel. So I guess the goal of what we're trying to do today is, is try and focus the conversations around how fintech is different to other tech companies um, and startups, particularly trying to help people in the crowd who are looking to raise capital. Um, from my perspective, uh, the hardest part of raising capital can be the, the really early, early stage. Um, so that seed through kind of pre-series A is the hardest um, from what I've seen. Um, so yeah, we wanna, we wanna focus on some of those areas. Also some of the trends that we see across the different regions. Uh, so across Australia, across Asia, so we've created a, a panel that, that really does focus on that. Uh, more, more likely, there'll also be people who work in fintechs or in financial services or tech companies who are looking to maybe get their first job in a fintech or, or looking kind of understand the industry a bit more. Uh, we always see a lot of those people at the, the usual in-person events. Um, there'll always be a few kind of businesses looking to provide services or products to either finance companies or tech companies in the crowd. Um, and then last but not least, there's always a good chunk of investors and angels um, who are looking for opportunities. So that's really what uh, my interpretation of a startup and angels is all about, is helping bring together that really early stage um, investor as well as really early stage uh, founder and, and help them get to that next stage. Um, so we've got people here today who've kind of done it all. Um, so <clears throat> I should probably explain a little bit about FundSquire. So, we provide funding, if you wanna flick over to the next page, please, Leo. We provide funding to early stage uh, startups. Uh, typically those are from that seed stage through to series B, most of them are pre-profit. Uh, they might be making a little bit of money sometimes, but most often uh, definitely not uh, profitable. Um, the average loan that we'd provide in Aussie dollars uh, would be about 350,000 and we've got a really high retention rate that we're really proud of. Uh, I guess, who we are as a company, we're an Australian fintech, but we exist in Australia, London, Toronto. We've got some new employees in, in Sydney as well. So yeah, we're really growing quickly. Uh, we just announced something earlier this week, so we've been really stretched. Uh, maybe it was last week now, um, was the our $75 million debt and equity raise, um, which was kind of our seed round, um, enabling us to set up for new products, new markets. So yeah, we're, we're also busy. Uh, it's not just Leo. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate everyone's, um, all the panel and all the people in the crowd here today. Um, please make sure you shoot through some questions because I'm sure mine will be boring, but yours probably be better. So yeah, give us some, give us some, um, some stuff to work through. Leo, next slide, please. Cool. And lastly, uh, so yeah, FundSquare's purpose is to empower founders to retain equity. Um, we do that through non-dilutive solutions. So, so rather than just getting investment, we know that investment is required. Um, so we go alongside that really well. So we just use as part of that mix, whether to, to buy a few months of runway or to help prepare for that big Series A or whatever it is. And, and the main reason why we do that is because raising money is really hard takes a lot of time. Um, and, and we know that it pulls founders away from focusing on their business and growing their business as they're permanently trying to get money into it. So we wanna solve a little part of that problem and, and help, help startups along the way. So enough about me and us. Uh, what I would like to talk about is now this awesome panel we've pulled together. So <clears throat> as I said, we tried to pull people um, from different markets, different experience backgrounds. Uh, so from WellPay, um, which is actually one of the biggest payments fintechs in the world, uh, based in London, but she's from New York and she's had really extensive experience in Hong Kong, um, the vice president of enterprise partners of WellPay. She currently leads a team um, across many different time zones um, who are managing relationships and technical integrations with uh, enterprise merchants. So uh, some of her experience comes from uh, Bain, uh, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America. So she's seen it all um, in terms of uh, the investment side, uh, what big 
financial and banking kind of businesses are working with, as well as, as the cutting edge, the fintechs who are disrupting them. So uh, it'll be awesome to hear a little bit more from her. Uh, we've also got from Salesforce, um, he's based in New South Wales. I thought it was Sydney, but it's actually the, uh, the Central Coast. Um, he also has extensive experience in Hong Kong, uh, as well as an awesome record collection, the Senior Director of Financial Services. Um, now he, I guess in his role at Salesforce, um, he works in financial services. So that's with the banks, with the fintechs all across Australia. And he's also got experience at Citibank, JP Morgan, ANZ and, and Click. So uh, Stuart Ward. Uh, we've also got a man from Sydney. He's a general partner of IAG Firemark Ventures. And for those of you who aren't aware, um, that's an Australia and kind of New Zealand focused corporate venture capital firm. Uh, he'll dive into what the difference between a CVC or a corporate uh, venture capital firm is and how that differentiates. But one of the key areas that they focus on is fintech. Uh, but outside of, of his role at, at Firemark Ventures, um, he's also been a founder himself, built a tech company, is a non-executive director for another tech company. And he's also got experience at UBS and um, Babcock and Brown. That's Mike Dovey. And... Last but not least, uh, based in Sydney, the, the Chief Revenue Officer uh, for a Brisbane-based fintech. There's actually a ton of fintechs at Brisbane, um, but one of the, the ones that I love the most um, is a, this banker turned fintech extraordinaire. Uh, she's also a financial wellness coach um, in, yeah, in parallel. Uh, but for those who you aren't aware, FooPay works across Australia and Europe. Um, and in my opinion, um, having worked at Afterpay for a little while, um, I see them as the most progressive and the most innovative buy now, pay later in the market. Um, they're doing a lot of work to disrupt um, a very crowded market in some ways. Um, but again, previous banker, NAB, ANZ, Macquarie, um, also a little bit of time at uh, Zinger, uh, which is another famous fintech, uh, is West, uh, sorry, Betsy West, Westcock. All right, that was a lot of brand names to rattle off. Sorry about that. So, um, <clears throat> trying to give you guys a bit of a, a flavor of uh, types of awesome businesses that we're working with today. But um, I wanted to start with Michaela. Um, welcome. What time is it where you are? Yeah, so it's eight, almost 8.15. Uh, so yeah, great to, great to join and see you guys at the end of your day. Thanks for jumping in. I know you had a wedding yesterday, so you're probably a bit weary, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll make do. So um, I guess WellPay uh, is underlying a lot of the transactions that a lot of big businesses are, are transacting, a lot of big merchants you're working with. I would say most people in the crowd probably aren't familiar with the types of businesses that you're supporting. And um, can you give us a bit of a flavor as to the companies you're working with currently? Yeah, sure. So in, in Australia and in Asia, some of our big uh, merchants include Afterpay. We support acquiring for Afterpay, Qantas, Jetstar, um, we work with Disney Plus globally, Deliveroo, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, food delivery in the UK, Emirates and British Airways, Dyson. So really when you think of companies that do kind of above 15, 20 million dollars of, um, of annual card transaction volume, you know, that's where we're working. And we have a very extensive retail and consumer book, and then also airlines and travel, which was not such a blessing in the past 18 months, but we're thrilled to see some business travel and restrictions come back. So, so volumes coming back to that sector as well. Fantastic. So those are some of the big businesses. Um, now coming back a bit closer to this crowd, most of the people here want to disrupt those companies. Can you tell me about some of the more um, smaller or more innovative companies that you've been working with? Yeah, so, you know, we, and this kind of cuts into who we work with for partners. So on the merchant side, you know, we really want to talk to companies that are looking to access customers and card transactions that may be looking to disrupt traditional businesses. So if you think of Uber, you know, as they were early in their growth, from a partner perspective, we're really looking for any kind of solution that's helping a merchant grow their business and reach new markets. So that could be increasing customer loyalty, could be that you have a really amazing way to improve user experience in e-commerce sites or to bridge omni-commerce. So we think of you know, bridging a card presence, so physical in-store experience as a customer with an online experience. Um, so we love to you know, hear from those companies and potentially work with some of those partners that are on the cutting edge, disrupting um, and really adding value for businesses, 
helping them increase their revenue, increase their reach to new customers. Cool, cool. So uh, I believe that in the fintech world, partnerships is the only way we can get anything done against the, the, the big industries and the big competitors. Um, what do you, what do your, uh, what does WorldPay look for in a partner? Yeah, so you know we're we're looking for to be able to to jointly add value for a merchant, right? So I think the most important thing for us is to understand your position in the in the market and how you have a newer innovative solution that's going to make a difference to merchants. Um, so we you know are happy to meet with partners who are a bit earlier stage in their business. I think that can be really powerful for us because we do have a very extensive book of large existing enterprise merchants where we can help make introductions and help add value for our merchants who are looking to include best of breed. Um, so one of the trends that we're seeing is really headless commerce. So we work with technology platforms like commerce tools that allow merchants to choose the best loyalty solution, the best inventory management solution, the best payment solution, which we of course hope is WorldPay. Um, and so we really like being able to put those packages together and help our merchants choose absolutely the best technology providers that they can to help support their business growth. Okay, so uh, I guess your team reaches all different parts. Uh, I'd like to understand from your perspective around different regions, um, what are the, the kind of the FinTech or the, or the even the payments differences between some of the regions? Yeah, so I will first give a shameless plug to our global payments report, which is a huge report we put out every year um, with country level data and on payment methods, uh, mobile wallet adoption, alternative payment methods, so APMs. So definitely Google that and check that out. You can download that free online. Um, but for us, I mean, especially thinking about the APAC market, you know, we see real differences in mobile wallet adoption. I mean, obviously not a secret that with the pandemic, cash has declined significantly in terms of transactions. So we see more and more com com uh, customers using mobile wallets. You know, Singapore has been, in Australia, um, has been at the cutting edge of this. Buy now, pay later, or what we would call point of sale financing methods also have really grown, especially for um, some of the developed market countries. And we see that growth coming in in Southeast Asia. And um, you know, as Betsy, I'm sure we'll be able to talk to you later, a lot of innovation in that space and, and ways to improve customer adoption and carry that loyalty from those customers with you across brands and across customer buying experiences. Um, so a lot of variance from country to country. And then we also see you know, the regulatory landscape in terms of what is allowed um, from an APM perspective, from re regulation, to really vary depending on regulators and, and where, uh, where people are comfortable. Um, so we see Australia, some of the Western countries, the Nordics especially, as a little bit more open from a regulatory perspective. Um, and then you've seen some changes recently like China cracking down on crypto um, transactions. So we've seen a little bit of regression in some markets from some of these newer, newer monetary and payment methods um, and hopefully we'll get a little bit of uniformity as regulators get more comfortable with the landscape overall. Cool, cool. Um, and I guess last question, I'm just thinking about how open banking will impact uh, WorldPay. Is it going to be impacted? How, how's that all going to play out? Yeah, so, you know, I think we are working on our open banking products and, and kind of embracing open banking. I think we see a lot of benefits in Europe where we've seen open banking come out um, in terms of the speed of customer transactions, moving money, um, transparency in transactions. And so we're really working to help companies understand how they can take advantage of open banking while also utilizing some of the more classic, you know, card schemes and payment methods that customers have, have um, come to use more frequently. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mikhail. I guess on the, 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 the merchant side, um, focusing on different payment types, definitely buy now, pay later is one that gets a lot of discussion. So I wanted to speak to Betsy for a moment um, on <clears throat> why is there so much, you know, good, bad and ugly attention on buy now, pay later? Like why, why do people, why do you think traditionally um, people are so pro credit card and pro credit checks and so anti buy now, pay later from your perspective? 
Yeah, I think um, there's a few factors playing into it. Um, the rapid explosion of growth, everyone's like, oh, it's a little bit mm -hmm. nerve wracking. And is this right? And is this responsible? I think also that um, traditional buy now, pay later um, has been exempt of regulation, particularly here in Australia, in terms of responsible lending that applies to credit cards and, you know, to, to regular loans. So a lot of people feel, and, and, and rightly so, that, um, there is a risk to consumers that they can access more money than they can afford to pay back. Um, so there's, you know, a bit of a view that it's it's more responsible to have a credit card because you go through those those lending assessments. Um, but I, I also think there's a lack of understanding around how true buy now pay later works. Um, you know, we often get commentators saying, oh, the interest rates on buy now pay later when you annualize them are really really expensive, but um, you know, a true buy now pay later transaction is a really small amount of credit, you know, typically under 2000 paid off over eight weeks. It's, it's fixed fees. Um, you can't have a really long term annualized credit rate. It's, it's capped. Um, whereas there are those I, I was going to say a naughty word. There are those other versions of buy now pay later, which are moving into that like credit card version where um, it's larger amounts and it's longer term. And, you know, particularly as a financial coach in my, in my little side hustle, um, mm -hmm. those are the ones that I see that are quite dangerous to individuals because it's that long term credit um, that there's accumulating fees, there's accumulating interest that, that does make it um, uh, potentially damaging to customers. And, and we see, you know, right now, traditional buy now, pay later, one in five customers incur late fees because they don't perform checks on affordability for customers. Um, and we were seeing the introduction of um, regulation in the UK around this in terms of responsibility for both the merchant and the provider to um, demonstrate that they have taken care to um, check that someone before they access the funding um, can afford to pay it back. And I think that's a great thing. And, you know, at FoodPay, we're big advocates for that because, you know, call it what you like, it is credit, you're lending money to someone. Um, so there is a responsibility there to, to make sure that they can afford it. Um, and we really adopt that um, affordability assessment that we've built into our process that we only lend money to people that we know can pay it back. Um, and every now and then I get into LinkedIn fights with people about the difference between credit checks and affordability checks. Had a charming troll this morning um, and just trying to explain the difference of why an affordability check is more appropriate than a credit check. But um, I won't dive into that unless you want me to. <laughs> um, I'll try to restrain myself from it as well because credit checks save the world. But um, anyway, I'll probably move on because um, I guess what we want to do is focus here on how your experience can help people in the crowd now. Uh, yeah. As a chief revenue officer, um, very critical role, especially in a fintech, especially in a sales oriented company. What does the day in the life of, of, of your team look like? Uh, and, <laughs> and what what learnings can people in the crowd who are looking for their first customer could you know maybe take away? Yeah, the hustle is real, <laughs> mm -hmm. and storytelling is really really important. It's a you know not only for capital raising but for in engaging your first customers, um, particularly if you're bringing something new to market or you're asking people to, to try something out for the first time, um, they've really got to buy into your story about what you do, why you do it, um, and, you know, how is that going to add value to, to their lives? So being really good storytellers is essential. Um, in terms of, you know, it depends what your focus is. Um, at FuPay, we have a consumer offering, but we also have a B2B offering. So on the consumer side, it's the, you know, what do you get by using FuPay? How do we help you manage your money better? How do we help you smooth out your cash flow? How do we help you find better deals? So it's a lot of storytelling there. But on the business side, it's about, well, what's the value that we bring to our merchants um, or to the financial services that we work with, either with our buy now, pay later um, merchant offering or as a service, the white label version of that. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, for us as a sales team, understanding how to engage the different customers um, that we target. So um, we're a little bit different to your traditional buy now pay later is that we're not just going after merchants being like, hey, here's how you sell more stuff. Um, you know, we've got a really strong narrative around responsible lending, helping customers smooth out their everyday expenses. So we're dealing with not so much retailers, but you know, utility providers, energy providers, 
um, financial services companies, um, all sorts of things. So it's really honing that message for the market to make sure that it resonates with them. And understanding your own sales cycle is really important too. So if we're pitching to a company that is, um, you know, fairly entrepreneurial, it's smaller, we know that's a shorter sales cycle because the owners of those businesses are typically the people you're talking to and they can make decisions quicker. Um, when we're pitching large enterprise clients, that can be a 12-month sale pitch. That, that's a long time. So just being really mindful around how long will it take to make this sale and making sure you've got the funding and the stamina and um, the, the kind of the right mix of clients to ensure that you, um, you don't run out of steam along the way. Yeah, I think uh, patience on the enterprise side is, uh, is the hardest part. Essential, essential, yes. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so now uh, I just want to cross to Mike. Um, I guess one of the key reports that I've seen recently mentioned that one in five dollars um, globally is going towards fintechs. And that's kind of why we wanted to focus on this. Um, and I guess yeah, from your perspective on, on the um, on the buy side, what's the uh, why is there a attraction for fintechs um, globally? Uh, so I think traditionally, um, when you think about what fintechs are disrupting, they're these huge legacy businesses, so the banks or the insurance companies, um, many of which have been around for over 100 years and um, still have huge captive customer bases, but perhaps are not serving them the best they can. Uh, so we're seeing this in Australia, certainly, where there's emerging players that are still just unpacking those old business models um, or in some instances, just filling the gap where they've pulled out. So we've seen that in um, SME financing, for example, um, yeah, with multiple new players that are just filling a void that has been left wide open by the big banks um, for no real good reason. Uh, we're seeing a similar thing in um, now with digital uh, home loans from end to end. Uh, where there's players like Athena Home Loans, TikTok Home Loans, which we're an investor in. Um, and they're just putting the customer first and finding clever ways to deliver the same uh, product at a lower cost with higher customer satisfaction. So it's a, um, you know, it's a huge industry that these players are unpacking and um, there's still a lot more to go, I think. So it doesn't surprise me that so much funding is flowing towards fintechs and insurtechs as well. Uh, so <clears throat> I guess like the, the Athena marketing is so good. I love it. They're branding. They're still, they're, they're still changing the game years after, um, uh, after launching. They're in lending Fundsquire, we're in B2B lending, slightly different, uh, Betsy buy now, pay you later. Payments is like the oldest FinTech kind of, um, from my perspective, one of the oldest kind of groups. What are the, what are the kind of the three growing trends you're seeing in FinTech kind of subsections? Uh, so something in support of them that we're seeing uh, getting a lot of attention is around um, fraud and KYC as well. So um, supporting technologies that um, can be used either by these emerging pure play fintechs like the Athenas of the world or the TikTok home loans um, of the world that rely on um, best in class KYC and onboarding processes and fraud uh, detection and processes as well in order to deliver their service. But also um, these same companies are actually still able to service the big incumbents as well that are trying to play catch up. So we're seeing this at IAG, um, the company that I'm a part of, um, where we're the venture fund for IAG, which is a large insurance company here in Australia. Uh, and we're very much trying to play catch up um, in terms of all of our internal processes and systems. And a lot of that comes down to uh, opportunities around data and opportunities to help us understand risk, understand our customers. So we're seeing a um, we're seeing this as a very significant growth area um, around companies that are finding smart ways to use data to service the needs of um, fintechs and shortechs and the legacy players as well. Um, another trend that we're seeing become more uh, relevant probably in the last uh, two or so years, particularly in Australia after the Banking Royal Commission is around financial wellbeing. Um, so we're seeing now uh, companies like We Money, for example, um, and other uh, robo advisors that are um, uh, uh, 
uh, like Stockspot is a good example. I know they've been around for a number of years, but they've really started hitting their stride in probably the last two or so years. But around providing high quality advice to um, whether it's uh, you know a younger demographic that is finding themselves in their first job and finding themselves with a paycheck for the first time and figuring out how to manage that money or even um, older generations that are um, looking to better manage their superannuation funds and to be able to do that, whether it's a self-managed super fund or an alternative to uh, the traditional industry funds. Um, but this concept around uh, providing high quality uh, financial advice that's truly fit for purpose is something we're seeing emerge more and more, particularly after the Banking Royal Commission. Um, and then outside of this, it's still just filling the gaps, I think, where the incumbents are just underserving people. So B2B financing, um, you know, we're looking at platforms at the moment, uh, particularly in that space, um, that are really just filling a gap where the banks have just decided that it's all too hard and it's not for them. Uh, but nonetheless, nothing has changed in the SME market necessarily in terms of their risk profile. Uh, there's just a large and, um, and growing underserviced market. So we see that as an ongoing trend as well. So <clears throat> I'm trying to squeeze as many questions as I can in. Uh, so I'm going to ask two very quick ones. Uh, first one being uh, corporate venture capital firm versus a normal venture capital firm. What are the key differences that, that you know, founders should be aware of? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think uh, probably most people uh, at this event you know, have a good idea of a traditional venture capital fund um, and how that works. With corporate, it can get a bit uh, more confused. So there's many variations of what it means to be a corporate venture capital fund. At IAG, um, we've set ourselves up uh, to try and mimic the best we can uh, behavior of a traditional venture fund. So we're very focused on financial returns. Um, we always try and put the founder first and we, you know, we're backing the founders um, and their vision. Uh, we see ourselves more, I suppose, as a thematic investor for IAG. So we're investing into themes that we think are important for the future of um, our business in insurance and we're investing with that strategic lens. But we're very mindful to not overwhelm the startups we invest in or to put uh, crazy terms in front of them that are going to hinder their ability to grow themselves or to uh, raise additional capital. So all corporate venture capital really means is that your investment function attached to a big corporate. But my um, guidance to uh, people that might be thinking about whether corporate venture capital is appropriate to them uh, is make sure you do your due diligence on, um, on, on who the corporate is and how they're set up. Um, make sure that they are set up um, with best practices in mind. So make sure that they've got dedicated funding that's available. Make sure that they have a streamlined approval process. Make sure that they don't try to um, sneak in terms that, uh, you know, cripple your growth. So we've seen this um, in some instances with, with corporates where they'll invest and then almost immediately after they invest into a company, um, almost seek to, uh, you know, destroy the growth prospects of that company that they invested in because they almost see it as a threat as opposed to um, a disruptive opportunity that they want to be a part in. Um, so, yeah, so just keep that in mind, I think, when you're approaching corporates because on the flip side of it is that if you find the right one, uh, and there's many out there, so most of the um, well-known ones in Australia that have a venture function, so NAB, uh, Westpac, ANZ, um, you know, ourselves, I think we've all set ourselves up to be quite mature in how we um, approach making investments. And I think when there's a partnership that can go alongside the investment when it's done right, um, you really do get these one plus one equals three type scenarios where you're able to leverage the support of the, the big corporate. Um, but hopefully they're doing it in a way to sort of let, set you free as well and, and let you grow um, down your own path. Yeah. Okay, so fintechs that are able to serve IAGs, like group of insurance, any any kind of uh, way to connect that is a good one. Stuart, don't worry, uh, Leo is calling me to make sure I don't forget you. I meant one or two questions for, for Mike, not for Stu. Got uh, some awesome questions for Stu as well. Uh, I was just <clears throat> speaking to our founder earlier around his love addiction with uh, Salesforce and trying to build everything into it. Um, he thinks it's the future and it's uh, it's definitely been the driving force of, of every big successful sales team that I've ever seen. So 
Um, what I wanted to speak to you about, Stu, um, was, <clears throat> I guess, where you're at at the moment working across banks as well as fintechs and financial services. Um, I guess it's not the big companies that eat the little companies. It's the fast companies that eat the slow companies, um, regardless of size. So, so with you, I guess you you get to see both sides of it: small companies, the big companies. Um, yeah, you know, what what from kind of your day to day do you think you could share to any small founder, uh, small startup founder um, who's who's on today? Thanks, Brandon. Look, Leo, you're forgiven. You, you already gave us a uh, free plug right at the start, mate, when you had your Slack screen up. That, they've uh, just joined the Salesforce family a few months ago. And so um, the pleasure's all mine to, uh, to talk to you all today. I think I'll start from, from, a, from a vision of the last 18 months. You know, the, the industry's been in you know, a fair, fair amount of crisis. We just emerged out of the very public Royal Commission where uh, individuals very much uh, lifted the corporate veil and, and had some very unfortunate customer examples. And that's, that has caused a great deal of unbundling. It's caused the majors to uh, come right back down to quite simplified core offerings, which has created a great deal of opportunity for startups, for fintechs to kind of you know, recompete for often a lot of those products and wealth or insurance. And a rebundling of financial services around like a new kind of trust. And I, you know, note Betsy in your side hustle around wellness. Wellness is a key example um, of how organizations are starting to rebundle um, financial services around those. You've also had obviously the, the loan deferrals, the policy uh, relief through COVID that's, that's really brought about trust for the industry entirely. What I would say to fintechs and startups is that what was always in the past seen as a moat around the industry, this regulatory moat that protected the industry is now really flipped. You know, that we've had a lot of um, new uh, licenses issued and we've had the new ways of offering financial services products, the changing relationship to credit that's given rise to buy now, pay later. And we've also seen therefore a different type of distribution model. So in the fallout, there's been a bunch of advisors who have left. There's been a bunch of businesses that simplified and therefore there's a lot of Aussies now who are without financial advice. There's a lot of Aussies who might have policies, life policies that are no longer understood and advisors no longer serving them. So firms that can come in with a really clear, easy to understand value proposition, be it startup or incumbent are doing very well. We also note that in the low interest environment that we're in today, while the uh, real estate boom is well underway, and I, you know, I talked about <laughs> my place in Terrigal doing well as a result of the digital natives all moving up here, there's also a blowout of application times. Um, and that's meant that fintechs that sell B2B, and Mike, we're happy to have Athena as a mutual, um, both customer Salesforce and we invest in them also, the organizations that really focus on the applicants by having an amazing streamlined process, but also humans at the ready to nudge them along to assist them when they've gotten stuck with a pay slip or, or uh, you know, access to their bank accounts for, for loan serviceability, they're doing incredibly well. We help organizations right through this process. So the startups, we assist with scalable compute. So Frollo is a great... Uh, open banking platform, they also did personal financial management app. They were, had some exposure on one of the current affairs type programs on, on financial wellness. They saw an explosion of people coming to their app. And as a result, they needed the compute to it. So you know, with our Roku platform, but as they get, you know, go to market, start um, penetrating, they need marketing services. They then need to um, service the client. So Betsy, when you go after your merchants or when food pay numbers go after their merchants, there's a whole new kind of servicing model and, and call, case management and things that's needed for things like refunds, for things like uh, managing promotions and things that, that fintechs need to consider so that the customer experience that's so dearly uh, invested in by marketing is then able to be delivered against by the services teams that, that serve the customers once they're customers. And I think finally, there's the B2B fintechs, those that are solving very kind of specific issues issues in the market. Mike talked about, for example, 
KYC. That's a huge problem. And the you know, very public AML issues that, that happened last year have given rise to very successful fintechs. Uh, Fenergo being an example that's out of Ireland that are doing well here on the onboarding journeys, initially in institutional, but into business banking and increasingly into retail. Um, we've got Basic, um, who are solving for the open banking challenge. And for the open banking side of things, it's very much this, a world which was about loan service abuse. It's a one-off uh, check of your loan serviceability. And the, what the industry is contemplating now is what does an ongoing uh, con a consent look like and what obligations does that uh, force me as, as a lender to, 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 to really understand and to act upon? And that's something that's still playing out. Now, I'll end on our app exchange. You know, as a sponsor of this um, we uh, webinar, we help these businesses like Basic, like Finergo, Encino, who do loan originations to, to deepen Salesforce uh, implementations and, and use cases. So we've, we've you know, get a huge uh, market in, in, in this space of, you know, over two bill, 200 billion generated in Salesforce ecosystem. But you also get a, an entire distribution channel, all the, uh, you know, the Salesforce meeting fintechs and the incumbents can include these fintechs in, the, in their value props as we do, you know, with Fenerg, as we do um, with basic creative mass is another great startup example. They saw the, the issues uh, that, that, that came out of the Royal Commission, most notably fee for no service and built extensions to our financial services cloud and now doing really well helping the financial planning industry kind of navigate its way through the huge regulatory change that's underway. Yeah, awesome. The, um, <clears throat> we could probably do a, a fourth day on app exchanges and marketplace and embedded finance, but we won't because Leo's given me the wrap up. But thank you very much. Really appreciate all, all of your words, guys. Sorry, Leo. So th thanks so much uh, all for, for your time. I think we could have kept uh, kept going for quite a while. Uh, big thanks to uh, to all of you. Uh, for sharing all these insights, and we'll continue the, the discussion in uh, in smaller group. Uh, really wanted to include, um, you know, kind of networking time for all of you to uh, uh, tell us what you're working on and kind of go a bit deeper, uh, asking for for tips to all of our experts and partners today. Uh, so big big thanks to uh, to all of you. But the con the conversation is not over yet. Um, I'll just uh, say a few words about the, the schedule for tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll be focusing on international, international uh, fintech, uh, many early stage startups um, from uh, Australia with, with Caroline and Clever, uh, Europe and Spain, especially with uh, Stockfink. Um, Mike will be joining from uh, Adelaide uh, and he's got a pretty big network in, uh, in fintech as well. And Julia will be joining from uh, Ivory Coast. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the day will be emceed by uh, my co-founder, Axel, uh, in the crowd. So some of you will meet him uh, during the, the networking section. Uh, and day three will be focusing on uh, scale-up. So some of the fastest growing company at the moment, including uh, AirWellX, AgriDigital, uh, Beta Tradeoff, Xero, uh, obviously. Uh, and the conversation will be uh, moderated by Pierre uh, from Rosemont Business Asia. Uh, so here we are, uh, networking time uh, is on. Um, so we'll all have, you will all have the chance to um, meet uh, hopefully six to eight people in your uh, breakout room. You'll be able to turn your mic on and meet your uh, breakout room facilitator. Um, so Florencia in my team will now allocate us to the various breakout room. Thank you so much and looking forward to seeing you tomorrow or in my room very soon. Today we live in an exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe, serving customers worldwide. 
We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network. Bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product life cycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers, building the future of technology for all, 